Amen. 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 First Samuel 25, we see in the very beginning of this chapter, if you notice, it says, and Samuel, and, all, and Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. We, we're seeing a transition in this chapter. This is a very transitional chapter. The hero that the book is named after, if you will, that man of God that was raised from the time of a young child to serve the Lord, now he was passing. We see a character fall off the scene, if you will, although we'll see him again. Now we see an introduction of two new characters. We see Nabal and also Abigail. And I want to talk tonight about the prophecy that Abigail gave, and I don't say that incorrectly. Women can prophesy, and there are many times in the Bible that God uses a woman prophet, or even what's called a prophetess. Now, I know that may ruffle some feathers. We're independent King James, uh, independent Baptist, fundamental. Women be silent. They should only be heard. But we're not oppressive. We're not oppressive. That's never been the spirit of it. That's not the Bible attitude of it. God's will is that the man of the house would stand and lead as he ought to. And many times in history when the man would not lead, there was a woman that God used, and he preached through a woman to teach the truth. In 1 Samuel chapter, well, let me say this. The title of this sermon, if it had one, would be When God Speaks Through a Woman, or we could just call it The Sickness of a Weak Male. When a man is weak and he's not doing what God says and things are out of order and he's lazy and he's not serving God in righteousness, then sometimes God has to use a woman to stand up and just take care of business. I've seen some Baptists that kind of ignore this fact and they just try to play it off and um, I'm not okay with that. I, I want to be more a Bible believer than I do a Baptist. I want to be a Christian more than I do want to be a fundamentalist. Um, the fundament I don't have a problem with the fundamentals and I don't have a problem with Baptist history as it were, although today there are many Baptists that have they've gone the way of the world, liberal, Calvinism, lordship, salvation, repenting of your sins. I'm not interested in any of that. I'm interested in what the Bible says, and God's trying to teach us a very important lesson here, and this is our introduction to Abigail. And she prophesies some truth that's very important for us to know and to understand. In America, we do suffer, we have a sickness of weak men, uh, and we need some women to kind of stand in the gap, but really we need the men to get back to doing what they're supposed to do. If you will look at verse number 3, 1 Samuel 25, verse number 3, now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. You say, who is this Abigail that we're going to talk about tonight? Uh, two things, this characteristic. Number one, we're given that she has good understanding. This means she knows the Bible, that she knows the Lord. She has a good understanding of wisdom. She knows what God's will is. She's searching after God's will in her life, and although she's living in a very oppressive situation with probably a narcissist and a chauvinist and an abuser of all these different terms we could pin on Nabal, he was a bad guy. And she was there in the situation. How she found herself there, we don't know. Was she sold into slavery and found her way in marriage? Did her parents marry off the wrong guy? Did she go into it not paying attention that she was about to marry the wrong person? We don't know. We're not given that detail. But obviously, those ought to be things that consider you that have the free will to choose who you marry. You better think very clearly and think twice. And if there's any reason not to, then don't do it. Put it off and wait for God's choice. Look what it says, a woman of good understanding. That ought to be said of the virtuous women in our church. And of a beautiful countenance. You know what that beautiful countenance means? You know what your countenance is? That's your smile. This woman was saved and smiling. I mess with the kids when they're playing their ukuleles and guitars, and I'll turn around before we get started, and I'll say, now, if you don't smile, I'm going to pinch your nose. And I, give them, I, I, I like to joke around, and make, it makes them smile. They didn't smile at me, and uh-uh, uh, you're not going to get me. Um, I think, listen, ladies, ladies, a beautiful countenance is the number one thing you have going for your appearance. 
Don't listen to the world that photoshops a body of, and they say, well, that's how you're supposed to look. The world's got it all wrong. That, they put people that have never had children and never lived real life, and then they photoshop them, and they put it on a magazine, and they put it out there as an idol, and it goes into the eyes of the young girls, and they try to aspire to be like that, and they don't even understand it's unobtainable, which is why be very careful what you look at on social media. You young ladies, please don't look at these foolish women that are showing off their body and showing their, their, their hair and their makeup and all this like it matters. No, it looks a beautiful countenance and a good understanding. This matters more. A beautiful countenance is saying she has a good spirit. She has a good attitude. She always had a positive word. She's smiling to people. You as a Christian, that's something you can have because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Right. I want to encourage the ladies in this. This is very important, okay? Um, so it says that she's a good understanding and of a beautiful countenance, so she's saved and smiling. But then it talks about him. It says, but the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of David. Now, churlish means cruel. He was oppressive. He was cruel. He's the kind of, he would like kick a dog just to do it. He would steal from somebody just to see if he could get away from it. Somebody that's churlish and cruel, they will afflict people just for fun so they can laugh about it and see what they can get away with. He was churlish and evil. So he was cruel. He was corrupt. This was a sinful guy. He was a very bad character. Uh, I want to show you who he was real quick before we move on. If you would look at verse number 14, we're looking at the characteristic of Nabal. Verse 14 says, But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. So David had been protecting his people, uh, Nabal's people. Then he sends some in and says, Hey, we need a little bit of help. Can we get some food? And he railed on them to rail. Those are fiery, hateful words that are insults. And he did. He insulted David, and he said some stuff that wasn't true. right? Uh, so he was a railer. That's a characteristic in Roman 1 of a reprobate. They love to rail on people and just hurt them with their words. Um, next, look at verse number 17. Now therefore, know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his house. Hold, for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. He says, you cannot reason with this person. Romans 1 tells us of a reprobate that they are implacable. There's nothing you can do to please them. He is a son of Belial. That's the devil. He says, he's such a son of Satan. You can't say anything to him. He's not going to receive it. This servant is coming to Abigail because he knows she'll listen. He says, David's going to come and destroy him and all of us because of the wicked leadership of Nabal. So he comes to Abigail, knowing she'll hear, and we see this guy, he's a son of the devil, and you can't even talk to him, he won't listen, you can't reason. Now what else can we learn about this man? Look at verse 25. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he, Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. If you go back to the Hebrew, you know what his name means? Fool. Folly. He's a fool. He's the fool. That's the name. Now listen, here's the warn warning uh, young men and young ladies. We like to play around, uh, but silliness sometimes turns into foolishness. And the Lord is not pleased with foolishness. There's a time and a place to be serious. And sometimes when you're playing and playing and playing, and your parents want your attention and want you to do something, don't be silly, be serious. Don't fall into this trap as Nabal of always being the fool. And of course, when you grow up and have your own kids, don't name any children the fool. Please don't do that, okay? Names mean things, all right? So we see that he's a fool. He's churlish. He's cruel. He's evil. Look at verse 36. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. 
So we see that he's also a drunkard. He abuses substances for his own pleasure. He's an alcoholic, we would call it today. The Bible calls him a drunkard. They can't control themselves when it comes to wine and pleasure. Uh, if you would go to Titus chapter 2 in the New Testament, I want to give you a few guidelines here. Uh, we know the Bible says that a woman should not teach over the men. It's very clear about that. And there's a reason and a purpose for that. But I do want to tell you that a woman can prophesy. And I do want to say that, uh, ladies, you should know the Word of God. And you should be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you should be ready to stand in the gap and give the truth and preach if God so calls you to. And listen, we're not going to have a woman preacher anytime soon behind our pulpit, okay? But we have ladies that go out and knock on doors and they preach at the doorstep to a lost soul. They have the authority to do that. The ladies also are called to encourage other ladies. The ladies are called to give wise counsel to their husband, and that's super valuable. We even see that with, with uh, Jesus, who, who was it? It was... Um, uh, it wasn't, uh, it was one of the, the political leaders, his wife, I'm wanting to say Pharaoh, but I know it's not Pharaoh. Um, uh, Pilate, thank you. It was a P. That's where my brain was at. Pilate's wife came to him filled with the Holy Spirit and preached to him and warned him through the Holy Spirit to have nothing to do with it. Now, ladies, you need to be the kind of wife that would give good, godly counsel to everybody that God opens the door for you to do that, whether it be your parents or your husband or your children or your friends or strangers in the store. You get the Word of God in your heart. You get filled with the Holy Spirit, and you share the Word of God with everyone that God leads you to. You need to be filled with the Spirit and filled with the Word. Now in Titus chapter 2, uh, before we read it, let me, let me give you a couple thoughts, right? In Proverbs, if you're doing your daily proverb, you probably saw in Proverbs chapter 1, he says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Do you know the mother is a lawgiver in the house? Children, pay attention to me right now. Children, your mother is a lawgiver in the house. Don't forsake what dad says, and you better not disobey mom when she gives you a law. He says the same thing in Proverbs 6, 20. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. You've been given parents. They give you the law. You obey what they say. You respect them. You do what they say because God gave you those parents. That's your job. And when, when God says something twice, you better uh, kind of perk up, right? Uh, why? Because it'll go well with you. You'll live a long life if you obey your parents. And remember, mom is a lawmaker in the house after dad's commandment. She's establishing it. And I really want you ladies to understand God really does care what comes out of your mouth. I want you ladies to understand that the words that come out of your mouth, your heavenly father cares. You're his daughter. He's concerned with your words. Words matter. In 1 Timothy 3, he says, uh, even so their wives must be grave. That means serious, not slanderers, uh, sober, faithful in all things. God's will, and now that you're saved, you're a daughter of the Most High God, He's going to protect you, but He wants you to have pure, uplifting words based on the Word of God. Now you're in Titus chapter 2, if you would with me, look at verse number 1. Titus 2, verse 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now, what type of things should we be talking about? Sound doctrine solid biblical doctrine. Uh, you young ladies should know your Bible stories, and you should know the commandments of the Lord, and you should know the will of God for your life, and you should also be looking for God's calling on your life. Uh, listen, this isn't just something, well, maybe he's going to be a preacher, and maybe he'll see that calling. I believe God has a calling and a purpose for every one of you, man and woman, boy and girl, and if you'll get a hold of that and say, well, wait a minute, one day I'm going to see that God has a purpose, why don't I search for it now and go after it? Uh, so he says, speak sound doctrine. Verse 2, men pay attention to this. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. 
uh, Dad, there's a reason God told you to be patient, because maybe sometimes men struggle with that. He just wants to remind us that it's our job to learn to be patient with mom and learn to be patient with the kids and learn uh, to be temperate, controlling ourselves, sound in the faith, having charity, showing that love. We need to demonstrate it. Brother Ross shared with me a little while back of a study that um, uh, a child's capacity or ability to be able to love is directly related to how much love the father shows to their child. We know that a baby's gonna get love from mama. I mean, a, a baby starts walking through and I mean, it doesn't take long. A mama picks up the baby. If it's not their baby, they'll, they'll love on it, right? And I mean, that's how ladies are. But men, as fathers, we need to be the leaders in love and charity and demonstrate love to the next generation. This is very important. Verse three, the aged women Likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Okay, the elder ladies need to make sure you're living holy. You're doing what God is happy with. He says, not false accusers. So we got to be careful about gossiping. Not given to much wine. Don't be a drunkard, right? Teachers of good things. Right here, God's telling us the older ladies are teachers. And you young ladies, it would do you well to learn from the elder ladies in the church. That is God's will. Amen. Verse 4, what do they teach? That they may teach the young women to be sober. Now, so sobriety, you say, yeah, yeah, I don't drink. Well, there's also the seriousness aspect of that definition of controlling your mind and being stable in the Lord. He says that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, that means not flashy, right? To be discreet, chaste, that's where we get the word chastity, keeping your lifestyle pure. And then it says, keepers at home. This is not a housekeeper. This is not a maid that just cleans the floor. That's not what this means. A keeper at home is keeping the standard of God, the standard of their husband for their household, their family. Uh, I've used the example that a goalie is called a keeper, isn't he? He's protecting, right? Uh, there's, uh, uh, the, there's the Second Amendment keepers. They, they keep uh, the defense, if you will, is a phrase that's often used. To keep something means you, you're preserving it. So a keeper at home is keeping godly standards in the house. So mom, as we saw in Proverbs, was called a lawgiver. Uh, mom, under dad, the goal is dad said this, that's what we're going to do. Not teaching the children eye service or hypocrisy. This does happen a lot of times where mom will get the children to go along after tearing dad down with their mouth and saying, well, you know how he is, and it's just a, kind of that thing, and we're just going to do it for now, and then you can do it your way later. No, no, we're, we're going, it, see, mom, when you teach your children that, you're also teaching them to disrespect you and to not honor you. We teach the right thing. Ladies, keep the standards at home. It says obedient to their own husbands. Next. That's hard sometimes. It does not say obedient to every husband. Right? If I, if I, uh, if I, Miss Sandy, you cook tacos tomorrow. <laughs> she doesn't have to listen to me. <laughs> she can say, no, Brother Larry wants meatloaf, okay? <laughs> you can forget about it. Obey your own husband that God's given you, right? It says, uh, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Why? Okay, listen, what good is your Christianity doing you if other people can look at what you're saying and they're like, if that's the kind of Christian they are, I don't want to be one. People will discredit Christ when we're lazy with our standards. So that's very important. Speaking sound doctrine is how we started in chapter 2. Go to Acts 21 with me. I'm going to give you a couple quick examples, and then we're going to go back to the story of Abigail. A prophetess. This word is used in the Bible about several different women. Prophetess means a woman prophet, a woman that prophesies. Deborah is a classic example of a woman that had to stand in the gap and God used. Miriam is also called a prophetess, and she 
ministered and taught the other ladies how to worship the Lord. And they sang the song of Moses and they followed Miriam as Miriam followed the leader that God had put over at that time, which was her brother Moses. And Moses was following the Lord, giving the word of the Lord. And so there were young children that were worshiping the Lord and singing his song because the order was in order, if that makes sense. Because God gave it to Moses, Moses obeyed, he gave it to Miriam, Miriam obeyed, gave it to the ladies and the children, and it went on around, and that was a song that everyone ministered and memorized because everybody followed the order that God had given. So she was called a prophetess as she prophesied. There are many others, I won't go through all of them. Um, I just want to give you some examples. First, let's look at a young example. You're in Acts 21. Acts 21, find verse 8. Let's find a young prophetess. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. These were of the seven that they laid hands on and ordained them to be evangelists in the church, uh, to take care of the tables, the distribution of money as it was coming into the church, so that the other men of God could just preach the word full time. He was an evangelist. And it says in the next verse, and the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Now that's neat. He had four daughters, they kept themselves pure, they were honoring the Lord with their body, and they were preaching, they were prophesying. This does not mean they went and started a church. This means they were out preaching the gospel actively everywhere they could go. Amen. They were, like their dad was an evangelist, they were prophetesses, they were prophesying through the power of of the Holy Spirit. So that's kind of a neat, that's a young example. Let's look at an old example. Go to Luke chapter 2. Go with me to Luke chapter 2. Women need to be prepared with the Bible and the Spirit. The warning, and I say it that way because some um, ladies are more emotional, you know, and I know some men are too logical. They have, they're not in touch with their emotions. And I'm not painting with a broad brush here, but if we're too emotional, we'll say we're led by the Spirit, but we're led by our own desire. What's important to know is what the Word of God says, and know what God's will is, and make sure you don't say something that contradicts the Word of God. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, let the spirits of the prophets be subject unto the prophets. So, ladies, if you're going to preach something that you believe is of God, it needs to be agree with the prophets in the Word of God. The Spirit will agree with the Scriptures is what that means, okay? So we're going to look at an old example. Find verse 36. Luke chapter 2, verse 36. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. Again, she was a virgin. She got married. She lived with this man for seven years. She did it God's way. Then apparently he passed, verse 37. And she was a widow of about four score and four years. How many years is that? 84. She was, un, she was a widow. She was unmarried for 84 years. Now, Miss Norma Jean's about 84. Is that right? Now, she was married for seven years before that 84. And she was anywhere from... I don't know, 15 to 21 before she got married, or whatever that culture, whatever that was, right? So maybe that's a lot of numbers, right? If we add all that up. I mean, maybe she was 130, 120. She was pushing it. She was right at probably the end of her days. What is she doing with her life? Well, she's a prophetess. It was very clear about that. Verse 37, and she was a widow of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple. She didn't leave the temple. That was the authority that she submitted herself under. But served God with fastings and prayers night and day. How did she work for God? She fasted and she prayed. I know, you know, fasting is, it's hard to do. I mean, it's hard for me to do. Boy, I feel like I miss, you know, I miss 12 hours without food and, oh, I'm, I'm famished, I'm ready to die. 
she was fairly old and nutrition's very important when you get old. And you know what she was doing? She was fasting and praying. Now, I do not believe that she was fasting and praying for her own needs or prayers herself. I believe she was interceding on behalf of others. I believe that she was praying for the needs of others. I believe that just as when the Lord Jesus Christ warned them, he said, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting, Jesus had already been fasting. His disciples had not. Why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus says, because you didn't fast. He had been fasting. He cast the devil out. Here, she probably learned this over time and said, wait a minute, when I afflict my flesh and I get close to you in the spirit, all of a sudden I find there's an opportunity to work for you, and so I'm just going to be ready because you never know. It's kind of like having bullets in your gun. I had a friend one time, and he got pulled over going through Texas. He said, the cop asked him if he had any guns, the trooper, and he said, yeah. He said, what do you have? And he said, well, show it to me. Well, pull it out. And he says, is it loaded? He says, no. He says, it's not loaded. Give me that thing. Let's load it. The, the trooper on the side of the road loaded his gun for him. You say, well, what good is that? I mean, what good is an empty gun? I mean, it's a paperweight, right? So, I mean, guns have a purpose, and without bullets, they're pointless. Now, Christians that are praying for people and ministering to people, if you're not fasting and praying in advance for an opportunity to be ready, then you're going to be ineffective. If you want to be effective in ministry, if you want God's ear for your own needs or because you want to help somebody else, fast and pray. She was doing it. This is an older saint teaching the younger saints. I imagine there were many, a young lady that came to the temple searching for an answer from God. And there she was as an older lady. She wasn't the high priest. She wasn't a Levite. She wasn't even the preacher that was reading the Scripture. She was just a lady that was filled with the Spirit, knew the Word of God, gave her life to serving others for God's sake. And young ladies would come to her, and she had a good word for them. Amen. She was praying for them. He says, look at verse 38. This is neat. And she, coming in that instant, gave thanks likewise. This is when she found Jesus, right? unto the Lord, and spake of Him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. That's kind of an encouraging word. Who did she tell about Jesus? Well, all them that were looking for redemption. Now, redemption here, speaking of salvation, that phrase is used elsewhere, kind of like the resurrection. There's many terms for the resurrection. The, the, but anyway, I, I love that term. They were looking for redemption, and she was speaking of Him to all them that look for redemption. That's kind of cool. Let's look at a bad example real quick. Let's go to Revelation 2. Go to Revelation chapter 2. So we've seen a young example. We've seen an old example. I think it's only fitting that we look and we see a bad example of a woman prophet, a prophetess that is not doing it God's way. And God is going to give a very stern warning to this woman. All right, find verse number 20 when you get to Revelation Chapter number two. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that, was, um, that woman Jezebel, uh, Hillary Clinton, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> thou sufferest <laughs> that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. She was getting up on the stage and seducing people. She was in the front saying, I'm the teacher, listen to me. And when the men got close, she tried to seduce them into fornication and adultery. This was a very wicked woman, and she was calling herself a prophetess. So if somebody comes up and says, I'm a prophetess, I would probably say red flag. I really believe, and I know we've got several ladies in here, both young and old, that say things that are godly, and I don't think any of them would just proclaim, I have, I have the office of prophetess. <laughs> I don't think any of you would, and I, I do know that there are several of you ladies in here that God has already used and will continue to use. This woman was different. She wanted the preeminence. She was probably a narcissist, much like Nabal. She's Jezebel, you know, Bel, as in that name comes from Baal, the devil. That's what the word comes from. 
Uh, verse 20, it suffer, you suffer that woman to preach, Jezebel. She calleth herself a prophetess, and to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Now listen, guys, verse 21 is very alarming to me. This is red letter, and Jesus is looking down at a church, and he says, your pastor is a woman. She's not saved. She's calling herself a prophet. And I gave her a chance to repent. If you ever doubt the mercy and the long-suffering of God, he's justified in striking her with lightning on the spot as soon as she steps up and says, I'm a prophet. He gave her a chance to repent. Boy, God's patient with us, isn't he? But she repented not. Verse 22, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. And that's the message. Listen, God looks at your heart, and we will pay for our works. And if there's false prophets, they're going to get theirs in time on earth, and they'll get theirs in hell. If you're sincere and you're serving the Lord and you feel like, man, I barely make it from day to day, and I'm barely making it from check to check, and there's times I just feel overwhelmed and overstressed and overcharged, and I don't know what to do. I, this is encouraging. He says, I will give unto every one of you according to your works. He searches your heart. He knows why you're working for Him. He searches the reins. That's the steering wheel. Of your, he knows what you're driving and why you're going and what you're focused and what you want. Verse 24, But I say unto you and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not, not, have not this doctrine, in which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. I mean, that's, pretty, that's a pretty bold statement that a woman preacher, that's the depths of Satan. That doctrine we could go through women preachers. I made a statement several years ago in a sermon, and somebody took a clip out of it, and it was an atheist website, and they tried to expose me with it. And I'll tell you the statement in a minute, but I, I, I took a step back. I said, okay, Lord, if I've said something that's not true, show it to me. And I, the statement was this. I've never seen a woman preacher that's saved. Now that's bold, because I'm not putting the condition of salvation on as long as you don't get up and preach. But if you start Googling famous woman preacher, Joyce Meyer, false prophet, false gospel, Paula White, she's an adulterer in a false prophet with a false gospel. And you could, I mean, you could start naming them, and we look them up, and you're going to find they preach a false gospel. This is not a chauvinistic standpoint. This is, the Bible calls it the depths of Satan. To, to have a woman pastor in a church goes against God's pattern. It's not anti-woman. Women prophesy. Go back to 1 Samuel. Let's do this. Let's look at 1 Samuel real quick. And we're going to get a couple nuggets of wisdom, some gems from what Abigail said. So David came to them. Hey, help my servants. They helped yours. He says, no, okay, we're going to war. Here comes David with the war party. He's ready to wipe everybody out. Abigail's going to step up, lay down her life because she loves people, and she's going to sacrifice herself, if you will, to try to stop the war and plead on behalf of the innocent. And she's going to lay down her life, but then God fills her with the Spirit and prophesies through her to David, and David recognizes it as such, and he's like, God's speaking through you. And God used you in this instance. Let's start in verse 23. And we'll be done in a few minutes. Lord willing here. We'll be brief on this. Verse 23. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell down before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground. She hurried up and she humbled herself. Now, actually, let me back up because she brings a gift this is relevant. Ladies, this sermon's for you, but let me give something to the men real quick. She brought a gift for David. Look at verse 18, guys. You're going to like this. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves. All right, she made fresh bread. And two bottles of wine. She brought some juice. And five sheep ready dressed. 
Oh man, she's making lamb burgers. All right, look, she's bringing a gift of food. She knows how to get to, I mean, isn't there a saying about get, how do you get to a man's heart? It's through his stomach, right? Amen. All right. So she brings 200 lamb burgers, uh, five measures of parched corn. We call that like granola today. And 100 clusters of raisins. That's a good snack. That could go in the granola. And 200 cakes of figs. 200 cakes of figs. You know what we call a little cake with, we call those cookies. <laughs> she even brought dessert. She brought little cakes or cookies and burgers and juice and granola. I mean, smart woman. She, know, she knows how to help the men. All right, so just had to give that, throw that in there uh, for any of you hungry men. All right, I hear somebody's stomach growling right now. So Abigail hurries up. We see in verse 23, she humbles herself. She bows herself down because to, to, she's not trying to elevate over David. Verse 24, and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be, and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience, and hear the words of thine handmaid. Again, she's petitioning him, please listen to me, this is my fault. Now, I'm not advocating that uh, somebody's in an abusive situation, say, oh, I must have done something wrong. That's not what's happening here. She's submitting herself. She's like, if I can get David to just stop and listen to the voice of reason, to God's standard. She's going to give God's law. If I can get him to stop, I can save the lives of everyone in our camp. Yeah. It said David was going to kill everyone that pisseth against the wall. That means all the men. She's literally like, he's going to come kill all, even the little boys, and I can save them all, I think, with God's help. And so David, it's my fault. And he's probably like, startled. here's all this food. And she has a big smile. She's a happy lady. He said, Wayne, it's my fault. Stop. And he's like, whoa, whoa, what's going on? So she uses this to petition him and stop the war. Verse 25, let not my Lord, I pray that she's going to continue to say, my Lord, speaking to David, submitting herself. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies, and they that seek evil to my Lord, be as Nabal. She is proclaiming, like she knows judgment's coming to Nabal. She comes to David and says, now wait, God has used me to stop you from hurting people because you know we're not supposed to avenge ourselves, right? What's it say in the New Testament? It says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. We know and we believe that God will take care of us and sometimes we take revenge in our own hand and we only get this much of satisfaction, but if we would submit ourselves to the Lord and give it to God, then we don't have that root of bitterness. We get the victory by overcoming and it not bothering us and then God gets them big time. He really takes care of business, right? So she's coming and just just kind of throwing all this at him, saying, Wayne, David, Wayne, David. Uh, she said, I didn't hear when you came. She's saying, if I had saw it, I would have fixed it. Verse 27, and now this blessing which thy handmaiden hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. She says, stop and eat for a minute, right? Men, we get hangry, right? If you, if, if, if you get home and your know, husband and wife start arguing, stop and Eat a lamb burger and get some cookies, right? <laughs> Just kind of fill your stomach for a second, right? Uh, verse 28, I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaiden. She's literally saying, oh, David, forgive me that I didn't hear when you came. And I'm sorry that I didn't give you food. Please take this food. Please take this offering. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thy handmaiden, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. This is a prophecy of David. She says, you're going to be established. Your family will be secure. You're going to be in charge. Because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. She says, David, you haven't messed up this far. Don't mess up now. God's going to establish your house and your name and your family because you're fighting God's battles. You're killing the bad guys, and you're saving the innocent. Verse 29, Yet a man is risen to pursue thee. And he's talking about Saul here. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee, and to seek thy soul. 
But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. That statement, it's like you think if you bound up a blanket and you put a ring in the middle of the blanket and you tied it up and you wrapped it out, you could throw that blanket wherever you want, the treasure's still inside. And she says, your soul is protected in God. You're not going to lose your life. God's protecting you. However, the enemies of Nabal and David, look what she says. She says, uh, thy soul, the, the soul of the Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God, and the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he had spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. She says, David, when you become king as God has promised, verse 31, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. She says, David, you're going to be king. God's going to do it. And when you get there, this little incident today isn't going to be a drop in the bucket. It's not going to bother you. If you just let it go and move on, it's not going to bother you for the rest of your time. However, if you do shed blood causelessly without a good reason, it's probably going to bother you. But God is establishing you. Please don't do it. Verse 32. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. Man, you know what I love to hear? And, and sometimes you guys say, boy, Pastor Fanning, good sermon. I, I, I like to hear that. And if you notice, my response is usually, praise the Lord. You know what I like to hear even better? <coughs> praise the Lord for that sermon. That's what I want to hear. Because if, if you say that out of sincerity, you're like, God used you to talk to me, then I know that I've been a faithful messenger. You know, I'm just the water hose giving you the clean water, right? And, and that's what he says. You notice, for Abigail's sake, he glorifies God. This is what we want on our account. When we get to heaven and God says, right here, this person said, your God is good. Amen to you. I'm going to reward you for that. Our flesh, we want to get the, well, say my name. Tell them how good I am, don't we? We're all guilty of it. That's the old man. The new man ought to be humble as the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what's best, ladies, when you come home and, or maybe your husband comes home and you guys are fighting, you're arguing, and you find that you, oh, God, help me. I want, to, I want to give you the glory in it, and I want to end this argument and let me feed him and love him and take care of his needs so he turns around and, you know, I thank God for a wife like you. That's the goal. Not, you're the best. Your name's up here. No, no, no. When he says, I thank God for a wife like you, that's success. That's in marriage. Now, we have that same opportunity in our friendships as well, in our business relationships as well. When others glorify God for how you served them, man, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what we have to look forward to. Verse 32, I'd like to read it again. He says, And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet thee. And blessed be thy advice. Blessed be thy advice. Ladies, prepare your heart now in the Word of God and through prayer to give good advice. You can do it. God wants to use you for your husband and your family. God wants to use you. Prepare your heart now. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, which hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood, and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, notice David recognized that he probably would have killed her too in his rage. She probably would have died. He hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast hasted and come to meet me. Surely there had not been left to Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. So David received of her hand that which she had brought to him, and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice, and have accepted thy person. This is a big statement. He said, You're a good person. God used you. God saved lives. God saved me from hurting you. God's been good. You spake up on the, on the Lord's half, and He kept me from hurting you. And it's interesting, He says, go in peace. And I really believe the first instance we see of her with Him, she's calling for peace. When she bowed down and fell at His feet and says, 
uh, let it be, I'm your handmaid, I pray, speak in thine audience, hear the words of thy handmaid. She's a peacemaker. A peacemaker. Now every Christian, that ought to be our spirit and that ought to be our attitude. That we're known as being peacemakers. If we can cease from the contention and strife, there's a blessing from God. And look at the end of it in verse 35. Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice. And I have accepted thy person. That means everything you said, I'm going to take care of. I'm going to remember you one day. Now, the rest of the story, she goes home, tells Nabal. He dies. It sounds like God gives him a heart attack. It just His heart turns into a stone. And then in verse 39, And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept this servant from evil, for the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. I want to stop with that tonight. That's the thought. She became his wife. She was probably in a situation where she felt there was no hope. I'm serving a wicked man. I'm working for a bad guy. He hurts me and he hurts others. But I'm just going to serve as unto the Lord Christ as we're commanded to do. I'm going to do it with a whole heart. I'm just going to do the best I can at whatever job. I'm going to keep my smile even if they're evil. I don't care what goes on. I'm going to be the peacemaker. And she does ultimately bring peace to that household, to her own life. Helps David preserve his peace. And then God avenged her. Isn't that interesting? She preached to David, don't avenge yourself. God will take care of your enemies. And ten days later, Nabal was dead. God avenged her enemies because she's preaching the truth to somebody else. She didn't have to poison him in the middle of the night. She didn't have to lift her hand. Guys, we need to remember this. God's called us to be peacemakers. God's called us to preach the gospel and, and the whole council and the rest of the Bible to this lost world. Let's not forget that. And ladies, I do want to encourage all you, even you young ladies in here, one day, Lord willing, you're going to be married to a righteous man. Don't marry a Nabal. And he's going to need a wise counselor. God wants to be able to use you to help your husband from sinning sometimes, and you're the one that can help. Until then, if you're not married, then uh, just trust the Lord that He's going to use you where you're at. And if, if uh, you're already married, then the Lord has you where He wants you at. Now get the Word in your heart and pray. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for this awesome example of Abigail, a woman of good understanding uh, with a beautiful countenance. Lord, I pray that You would help the virtuous women that are in this church just to get closer to You and see that there is a time and a place that You will call them to preach. Lord, I pray You would help all of us to prepare ourselves to preach. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.